cases are rising and children ages 0 to 11 years who cannot get vaccinated are positive and the schools are opening because that's not where the clusters are coming from. Good planning. Whoever thought about it, I'm being sarcastic. Oh, no way. <laughs> uh, Sean, good morning. Let me just, because I'm pretty sure you have your own feelings. And this is really just, uh, it's a tough conversation, right? Because uh, we have yes. the educators and the schools and, and everybody impressing upon us uh, the importance of face-to-face learning, which, I mean, yeah, we get it, right? Um, but then on the other side, uh, we have the governor suspended face-to-face learning and when she did that she told us why she said the community spread is so rampant that we have to protect our children that it's only a matter of time before the cases get into the schools even though at that time there was no evidence of uh, school-based transmission and so that was her justification for suspending face-to-face learning and here we are weeks later Nothing has changed. It's actually gotten worse. And she issues an executive order mandating a return to -to face-to-face learning. But we didn't really get an explanation on it. And what we did get was public health released this data um, about the child cases, which uh, I'm sure you know from August to September 13, we saw 600 uh, positives. So just like from a messaging standpoint, of course, we all know that it used to be with the, the Camacho administration. You've done your share of messaging. Uh, could this have been maybe packaged in a better way? Oh, absolutely, Chris. Uh, there's a good morning, Chris and Sabrina and Jason and the team. It's a important to remember that as uh, I think one of the people, one of the stakeholders that you failed to mention in there, and it's not a failure, it's just the healthcare system, you know, that they have been uh, saying all along, go and get vaccinated. Obviously it helps in terms of how we are uh, seeing cases at GMH, GRMC, Naval Hospital, uh, clinics everywhere. Um, the healthcare, uh, entire healthcare business on Guam and all healthcare workers really are, are the ones that you know, we're kind of missing in this. They've, they've given as much as they can give. They give the reports, they, they're, they're taking care of people, they have the treatments, they have all of these PPEs. They're getting sick too. Let's not forget that they're also parents, that they also have kids in our school systems. So they're a stakeholder and a, and a big one at that. But the, the messaging here is that they could have waited a bit. I think that they, uh, they, you know, there's no real need to jump so far ahead. Make sure that the message is clear, that all everyone is aware of what's about to happen, and then roll it out. I think that that's not uh, too far gone today uh, from the days when, as you mentioned, working in the Camacho administration. We, we spent a little bit of time to wait to make sure that we had the message and then advised everyone, and then rolled it out. I don't see the difficulty uh, in that. Yeah, instead what we have is this, uh, it's almost like this, like, oh, everybody, ready to go back to school Monday, okay. And there's no explanation. I mean, I don't know. I feel like we're reasonable people, and if you're going to shut down the schools and you're going to tell us why you're shutting them down, then I would assume if you're going to reopen them, you're going to tell us why you're going to reopen them when the conditions are worse. Because to me, it kind of oh. seems like with, without that accompanying messaging, an explanation. It almost just seems like we're sending our kids out in the middle of the typhoon, right? Because these right, conditions. You know, the, I mean, right. You know, Christy. <laughs> yeah, that, that Dr. Ann Babutsky report that she that when she came on your air, yeah. wasn't wouldn't wouldn't that have been more important a little bit sooner? Dr. Babutsky is a you know is a great resource, and she she's had it. But then we we think about that that could have been the message. Um, a this is why we closed it, uh, based on what we've seen. There is nothing wrong with that. And uh, again, we've talked about it on this program so many times about being realistic with the information that's being presented. And then give the reassurance to the community that things are being done to protect in the schools. There is no real school spread, we know that. It's happening at home. But uh, you know, the, you're right, Chris, you said it correctly. Again, why, why, why be a little bit mixed? They should have been more deliberate with their message. Uh, well, let's change gears uh, here. Uh, sure. GovGuam budget. How did the GovGuam budget? I mean, I feel like there's so much going on with the COVID and there's everything that it's almost like the budget was an asterisk, but there was actually a budget that was passed. Uh, oh, yeah, there was. <laughs> <laughs> right? There was a budget? Yeah. They passed yeah. a budget. It was, it was. It was. lapsed oh, into law. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it lapsed into law. And then the governor took a big dump on it because. 
She was just mad, which to me, Sean, was very interesting because she made the budget process like the most difficult budget process ever, right? I mean, they weren't saying anything about ARP, and then for her to come out afterwards and be like, I don't like this budget, this budget, thing, I don't know. I'm a, my grandma used to say, like, if you're not going to help, then don't complain. Right. You know, Chris, uh, you know, when I looked at the budget, I think uh, let, let's take out that plan for federal love away for a second. Right. The, the mandate of the Guam legislature is to produce a balanced budget. That is their single mandate. Nobody cares about oversight hearings. Nobody really does engage and really gives a squirt about a resolution. What they care about is the most important thing is how government money will be spent for 365 days across three branches of government. So the budget that was passed was their their work. Now the governor uh, did, uh, in tour credit, gave the, the budget to them back in January as mandated by law. She has to give the plan. So when she gives it, it's their responsibility. They can take it and, and pass it, or they can come up with their own plan. Obviously, they came up with their own plan. And then the lapse, I think, is that's the one I think is the heart and soul of the podcast this week is about the lapse. Right. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, play this little uh, snibblet from uh, the That's It, That's All uh, podcast. we got a lot of great content on the KUAM Podcast Network, Jason. Yep. And Sean's podcast is already up on the feed. So if you guys have us on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, Audible, and everything like that, you're going to get this episode, which we're going to play like right now. When you look at all that work, when you look at all that work, all the testimony, all the number crunching, it is a confusing document that really doesn't reflect the current state of the government and the community today. It is like lawmakers in the U.S. territory were living in their own world. They put the flex on agencies that really needed all the help that they could get. While there is some expectation of plenty of federal assistance into GovGuam coffers, this budget, while mostly cut, has never been purported to be balanced, with little or no tourist activity to speak of, and federal monies for those deployed to Guam like drops in a bucket, and the Biden administration shifting the U.S. defense posture, this FY 2022 budget just seems to be a best guess than anything. Even in years when the island was ravaged by natural disaster, the Budget Act reflected that semblance of reality in Guam's economy and optimistic outlook for the days to come. This year, Bill 55-36 was really not that at all. Interestingly, the Guam judiciary, suffering from status quo budgets for the past four years, got an increase. Even the Guam legislature gave themselves a $482,000 raise. The governor's office, well, a status quo budget. Putting this all together, lawmakers called this budget, quote, an historic setting precedent. Based on what was laid out, the statement reminds me of the statement of a drunk guy during the holiday season, thankful for eating all the good food and drinking the entire party under the table well before the dessert table was being laid out. The proverbial pats on the back are so strange from our lawmakers. I find it hard to understand. Taking claim for such a bad piece of... The grown and sexy there. That's uh, the, that's it. That's all. <laughs> Podcast with Sean Gumatato. Uh Sean, we know you got to... Sean, Sean is really a master of knowing how to like very artfully like lob a couple like verbal grenades. and <laughs> The art of the... Uh... Classy disc. Hey, I was just feeling that in the moment. How's yeah. that, guys? <laughs> uh, Sean, we, we know you got a long uh, sports uh, background, and I, uh, I, I know Bree wanted to bend your ear a little bit about uh, this sure. latest executive order. Yeah, and uh, the mm, mandate to show proof of vaccination for athletes, coaches, or specifically athletes 16, and I think it's one month and, and older. Or if you don't... Uh, you decline the vaccinations then you would uh, submit to the weekly covid tests right um you know you know for i guess for the, it's two uh, i guess we have two scenarios right you yeah. have high school sports that's happening now and then you have all these other sports leagues that are happening let me talk about the high school sports well my my son ej who is a junior at notre dame he's probably going to be happy as a lark because he's vaccinated and he can go and practice and he can begin re getting ready to play uh high school boys soccer which i think for all those kids it's a chance to get out of their house, get away from their computers, 
and kind of get back to normal, at least in some case. So I think it's a good thing uh, for those that are testing. I think that's going to be a challenge for the schools because that's a lot of money and a lot of time to be dedicated for testing. So I'm hoping that there's going to see some um, some kind of resolution to the testing side. On the other side of the house, the leagues, as you know, you have the Guam Major League going on. Uh, I mean, they're mostly vaccinated, but I play master's soccer uh, at the Guam Football Association. And we had we were like the test test case. Everyone was vaccinated. Well, obviously, because a bunch of old guys, <laughs> so it makes a little <laughs> bit of sense. Uh, but the but there was no problems, and the their pro, their program and the process to do it, I think it is now world class. And I, I think everyone should call GFA and figure out how do they do it because they they do a lot of using of the technology today, and it it can it can be work it can be worked out. Yes, the crowds aren't as big. But hey, listen, if mom and dad get to go to the game and be baby sister, perhaps, that's probably okay in these COVID times. And I think it's a, a smart move to get sports back on. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned the crowds. Um, was there, is there any requirement for spectators? Um, I think they have to also show, um, if I'm not mistaken, they're going to say, hey, are, are you vaccinated? And um, yes, and they, they take names. Even if they're not, you're outside, especially when you're in large venues like uh, let's say uh, the field of GFA, you, you may be at St. John's field, you're at uh, whatever field you're at, where they play at, whatever yeah. the case might be, there's that case that they they could do that. Yeah. I, and, I, and they should be able to provide. Yeah, I just asked that because it wasn't real clear in the uh, executive order regarding uh, spectators. It just said yeah. that as long as it uh, complies with the, the public health, uh, applicable public health guidance, but I don't think the public health guidance is out just yet with regard to yeah. this particular executive I, order. I think they were working on it, Brie, last night, but, yeah. I, but I was also, uh, I, you're right. Um, if, if they do ask for vaccinated people, that, that's fine, yeah. but it's probably not necessary, especially if you're outside, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're going to have a, uh, maybe they get a separate bleachers for the unvaccinated people like two miles away and give them binoculars. <laughs> Use the ARP money uh, to give them know, the binoculars. No, I was thinking more or less maybe the bubble, they should have like a bubble they go in. There you and, go. You know. A bubble with negative air pressure, and then they. But it has to be a mile away, and you give them binoculars with the ARP money so they can watch their kids <laughs> play the sport. Yeah, something like that to tell them, hey, guys, a great, uh, you know, alert, alert, they're not vaccinated. <laughs> rip, rip, rip. Here they are. Very right, good. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, so uh, hey, thanks for um, everything that you guys do. And again, uh, you can catch the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Pandora, the iHeartRadio app. And of course, it's part of the KWM podcast network. Yes. So thank you guys. Some the, some of the best programming in the region is on the podcast network. So thank you, Sean. Listen in. And, Stop it some more. Okay. The Sean show is also on YouTube. If you guys want to watch it, like on your smart TV, if you want to watch it on your on your mobile device, and his feed is already up. So if you guys want to subscribe to Sean's YouTube channel, we're also going to share it. So I got it scheduled. It's going to run at twelve o'clock on our uh, Facebook feed. So that that little uh, sneak peek of what you got from Sean's thoughts on GovGuam budgeting. You're going to hear like the entire conversation. That's at 12 o'clock um, on our timeline. Thank thanks, you, Sean. Sean. All right, thanks, guys. There you go. We're, take care. You too, my friend. We're going to take a quick break at 727. We're back with more of The Link next. Good morning, Friday. We know you're tired of hearing about COVID.